everybody, it is Jack Murphy. You are back on the Jack Murphy Live podcast, the flagship podcast of the Liminal Order. You can find me on Twitter at Jack Murphy Live, at the website jackmurphylive.com, all over the internet at Jack Murphy Live. Come by the website, check out what we're doing, sign up for the mailing list, get involved. But enough about all that. Uh, I am very excited about my guest today. It's somebody that I have been aware of and a fan of for a long time, going back, man, almost 10, 15 years at this point. You and I are both getting on a little bit these days. Uh, somebody who is also from the same hometown I am from, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, yeah, man, Carroll High School. I would have gone to uh, Northrop, I think, from the north side, Fort Wayne. Uh, but uh, he is an MMA legend, a superstar in the sport, a one-time UFC title contender. Had one of the best runs I'd ever seen, one of the most exciting things that I'd seen in the UFC. Uh, the one and only John Fitch. How you doing, John Fitch? I'm doing great, Jack. Thanks for having me on. Oh, man, my absolute pleasure. So uh, there's a ton of things that I want to talk about today. Uh, but let's start off just first with the book. So John, John has written a book called Failing Upwards and Death by Ego. And uh, that's actually how John and I started uh, getting, getting in touch was uh, he was writing a book and mm -hmm. I was writing my book. And we started talking about editors and just how we could help. And we ended up having the same editor on the book. <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit about your book, because that's like a good framework for us to give the guys listening a, a little bit of background as to who you are and, yeah. <clears throat> and what you're about. So, yeah, um, well, you're downplaying your role a little bit because uh, <laughs> I, I really didn't know what what I was doing or how to do it. And you had just come out with Democrats Deplorable and you were self-published. And I, I uh, reached out to you just to uh, kind of pick your brain. And, and see if I get some direction because I had, you know, all these journals that I wanted to kind of share with people, a lot of life experience type stuff, a lot of learning, and uh, I didn't know how to go about putting it together. And you recommended uh, Upwork and an editor, and he, w he was great. He helped me expand and put a lot more depth into my book and uh, made it a lot more interesting, I think. Yeah, well, writing. you know, it's uh, interesting when people start out writing, they think, oh, I'm just going to write editing. That sounds kind of dumb, but it turns out that like, editing is one of the most important parts. Yeah. And every writer, every writer, every single writer has a great editor behind them. I have the red hen. She edited my book. She did a wonderful job. And then I sent it on to our mutual guy, and he did it even better. But uh, the book is about your experience going from Indiana all the way out to California and leading into leading to MMA. But, but first, so you were journaling this whole entire time, right? So yeah. how, is that something that you had always done? Uh, yeah. or did you, how, how did you get into to journaling? No, I, uh, I had a really bad, uh, season in college once, right? So, you know, successful in uh, junior high, high school, this is wrestling, uh, right? Wrestling, yeah. My, my red shirt year, which is like a, a non, uh, it's like a, a, a practice year, your red shirt right. year. You perceive I went, I went, like a year of eligibility, yeah. right? So I, I, I went like eight and four, so I did okay that. And then in my first year, I moved up a weight class because we didn't have a guy. And that was kind of a mixed record, but it wasn't bad. I still had a winning record. And I was just a freshman competing against bigger guys. So, and then the next year, it was the first time I was the starter at a weight class and I, I just was cutting weight wrong. I was doing everything wrong and I got destroyed all year long and uh, it kind of woke me up. I went eight and 31 that year. Oof. Yeah. It was a big 10 school. I mean, I wrestled like 15 guys ranked in the top uh, 20. So wait, I was wait, 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 wait. wrestling good guys. But how, how did, So according to the book, man, you didn't even show up to Purdue. This is a D1, Big mm. 10, big time wrestling program in the Midwest, man. <laughs> like... Big old farm boys, corn fed, the, the, the whole thing. But you literally just showed up one day. Like, how did that work? How do you walk on to a well, D1 program? Well, that's the thing is there's not really money in wrestling. Most guys uh, are walk-ons. The majority oh, okay. of guys are walk-ons. So we had like 17 guys that came out with the freshman team that year. We only had like two guys on scholarship, three guys on scholarship. Because um, it's not money in wrestling. Right. So... Uh, you know, but after the first two weeks, like more than 50% of those guys quit. Right. You know, so, uh, and no money crazy. in wrestling. That's sort of like the story of the U UFC fighter too, isn't it? <laughs> kind of. I think it's a little different. Things are changing now with, uh, the internet, I believe and social media because yeah. people, people are following along with wrestling more now. It's easier to know who people are and see matches across the world. So right. I think, I think there's slowly money coming into wrestling. 
Right. Because I remember in the early days, like uh, half the guys who ended up in the UFC were like, yeah, I wrestled and then there was no money oh. in that. So I, what, what was I going to do next? I'm going to start fighting people. Yep. That's kind of <laughs> what kind of what I did. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so after it, that, after it, that bad season, I, yeah. I got a, uh, uh, our coach came out with your workout journals. So we keep ourselves accountable. He's always talking about accountability. And, uh, some of the guys took them, some didn't, I took one. I said, oh, I'll try it. And, you know, I started training hard, like the week after the season ended. Mm-hmm. So like I was already working out and getting ready for the next year. And I was like, we're going to redo these things. I'm going to, I'm going to recommit myself. I, uh, I think I read an article about Kale Sanderson who went undefeated uh, through college wrestling and it talked about how his life and his, his life structure was uh, school, girlfriend, wrestling. That was yeah. it. That was mm-hmm. it. There was no partying. There was no socializing. And, and the girlfriend had to, you know, make time <laughs> to be around right. him because those were the priorities was the school and the wrestling. Right. So I was like, man, I was like, that's why these guys are so good because they, they just fully immerse themselves into what they're doing. That's everything they do. And, and for me, I worked my butt off during the season, but in the off season, I had, I partied, man. I'd like to have a good time. Right. So, you know, <laughs> in the book, I talk about it in the book a lot, you know, chasing thick girls around Indiana. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, so then I started to really commit myself and doing things the right way. And I spent that whole summer and keeping a journal that whole summer. Uh, at the end of the summer, I kind of put the journal down because I developed good habits and uh, I was doing things the right way. And then I, I started winning matches. I started getting a lot better. And then I picked the journal back up again when I was in grad school and I had started fighting and I was getting ready to move to California. And I was like, you know what? This, this journal helped me a lot before and keeping myself accountable and uh, this is probably going to be a really great story. So if I write more about what I'm doing, it's probably pretty cool. So I, I started, uh, you know, putting a lot more detail into that stuff. Right. So what was it like coming off that that first year, getting your, getting, you know, I was going to say getting your ass kicked a bunch, but I'm talking to John Fish. Get, getting, I mean, it having, was. I got Having destroyed. a bunch of losses. <laughs> I had a bunch of losses. I got my ass kicked that year. It was, so, it was demoralizing. Right. I so lost. how do you recover from something like that? How do you how do you get your mind right to like just double triple down? You refocus and and uh, you know you do what I did. You, you go monk mode and you put yourself one hundred percent into it. There you go. Uh, or you or you or you move on. Right. You, all the way in or all the way out. And right. that's that was the choice. Was like, do I quit and I'm just done, or do we say you know f that and we double triple down? Right. I, I chose to double down and that's usually what I've, <laughs> I've chosen to do most of the times when things get tough, I end up doubling down. It's paid off. Okay. So far. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's the mark of, uh, people that win is, uh, being able to double down and refocus even in the, the face of the face of adversity. And then with combat sports, it's like, uh, one of those things where, you know, you really, you really have to be focused because the consequences it are much in a worse. Second, than, yeah. Yeah, or much worse than just failing, right? Split second. You got to always be on. Yeah. So keep going through your college career. Things finally turn around. You're, you're, you're journaling. You're working out. You're focused. Mm-hmm. And what, what happened then through the rest of the time there at Purdue? Oh, uh, well, uh, you know, I stopped, I stopped journaling after that, after that uh, summer because, you know, school work started up. All this other stuff started up. I was busy again. And I already developed a good habits. You know, I probably should have, looking back, if I could have forced myself, I would have kept doing it. But I, I put it away because I think I was like, oh, I got this. And then I, I kept with that. And then um, I had my junior year, I was much more successful. But uh, halfway through, I blew my knee out. Hmm. So I only got to wrestle half that year. And then uh, senior year was was fairly competitive. I did good that year. I was, I was an overtime point away from going to uh, NCAAs. I lost to a two or three time at, uh, all American. Um, so I had, I finished strong, but I was still like, I wasn't done. I was like, man, I was like, I'm just starting to figure this out. I just started to figure out how to wrestle and win. Hmm. And now like, I'm, it's how many, over. how many years into it? Uh, yeah, exactly. My last two, it was like my last two years, I actually figured out how to wrestle and how to do it. Right. But how long had you been wrestling by then? Man, I started when I was like nine. So at that time I was like, <laughs> You know, I'm like 21, 22 years old when I finally started. I'm like, oh, I, I've got it. I finally, because in high school and junior high, mostly it was uh, um, hard work conditioning that beat the guys. You know, I had like, you know, double leg to single leg and then one pinning combination. That's all it took. Right. You know, because you just drive it down their throats. But it was different, you know, college wrestlers are a different animal. And it took it took me a while to catch up and get to, get on to speed. 
Well, that's that's something that people need to to take note of is that you can do something for nine, ten, eleven, twelve <laughs> years, and then only only start to really be able to to figure it out at yeah. the end, man. You, you like just, perseverance, just starting to figure it out at you know twenty two. Like ah, <laughs> like light bulbs are clicking, right? And, and uh, yeah, but so then I was like, okay, so am I am I going to try to make a national or Olympic team, uh, or do I try this fighting thing? Because I had an assistant coach, Tom Erickson, who was fighting already. And like him and, him and Mark Coleman and Gary Goodrich, these guys would, they'd come to town and then they'd tell the stories. And, yeah. You know, tell us about Yakuza guys, gangsters in Brazil, Russian right. mafia, you know, hookers, strippers, like right. crazy stories. And I'm like, hmm, this sounds interesting. And you're getting paid twenty five to 75000 per fight. Hmm, that's interesting too. Mm-hmm. Then one of my buddies who was an All-American came home from trying to make a national team. He plays sixth. He had his face just destroyed. It looked like he'd been in a bad fight and he had jumped. He just got married and he was living in his mom's basement because he had no money. <laughs> right. And he, right. he plays sixth, which was really good. But right. I was like, hmm, like which which side should I go? I was like, I'll, I'll try the fighting thing. That, what what year was this that you were uh, listening to Mark Coleman and Gary Goodrich like tell stories? Because for guys who don't know, like it was probably two around of the pioneers, man. Yeah, like two thousand to two thousand. I graduated Purdue two thousand two and did a great year of grad school, but it was it was before that time. So like my junior year, or whatever, like they had started to come around. I think I think I met Ian Freeman first, right after he had beaten Frank Muir, man, um, in England. Well, so, I mean. I remember I was in high school, like in the '90s, and we would we would watch the early UFCs on on VHS in my friend's basement. Mm-hmm. And I swear to God, I saw Gary Goodrich like kill a dude. <laughs> I mean, yep, he got him he reverse crucifix to the elbow. Yep, yep, and he just pounded him in the head with the elbow over and over and over again. And back then, it, you just never knew what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. It just was like so tense and scary and like crazy no one had ever seen anything like it and you're talking about brazilian gangsters and yakuza and whatever Mm -hmm. so those are like the back 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 like some of the early valley tudo stuff i remember seeing clips with like pride uh, stuff bondrele silva with you know bare knuckles yeah yeah and so you know it was a it was like a very underground uh sort of dark smoky weird i think there was a i think it was mark kerr was fighting somewhere in brazil and he had headbutted the guy on the ground and had a big gash over his eye and he was sticking his thumb in the gash yeah. trying to make it bigger to stop the fight right. like that's yeah. insanity that's it, it kinda, was insane yeah that's my, insane. my favorite story from ufc one is like there were some potential producers in the audience uh watching the event and uh that dutch kickboxer guy smacks the the hawaiian dude in the mouth with a kick and the tooth literally went flying into the stands and like went by the producers and they were just like oh, fuck this we're out of here the barbaric uh, but it, it came it had come a long way it come it's obviously come a long way mm-hmm. to the point now and we're going to talk about this later where talking about unions and contracts and, uh, you know, revenue sharing and, mm-hmm. and TV, you know, re- revenue and gate revenue and all this stuff. But how is it that you go from Purdue? Like who, who was like, Hey dude, come on out to California. Come, come nobody. Train with us. <laughs> nobody. Uh, nice. the majority of people thought I was crazy and just, there's just get a job. What are you talking about? Like my best friend, the guy, my best man at my wedding was like, what are you doing? Like, cause I was fighting already in, in grad school. So I wanted a scholarship uh that paid for a year of grad school so i had um that was a big factor in me going pro because uh or me starting to fight because i didn't have to do anything for a year i took a, a six uh six credits a semester so i took the minimum and then they paid me three thousand dollars at the beginning of each semester so that was for room and board so i was rich right <laughs> and i only had to go to two i only had to go to like four classes a week right so uh i thought that was great and that that like, give me time to like train and, and travel and fight and kind of figure out what I wanted to do. Were you doing like underground shows, like independent shows in Indiana or something? No, or? we called it. We used to call it the farmer circuit because <laughs> it was like the, we would just hear about a fight somewhere. I was like uh, Brian Ebersol. I met him in my very first fight, and he had been fighting since he was like nineteen. So he'd already had two years of fighting in. So he knew all these promoters. So uh, he would hear about fights in another state, in Iowa or in Minnesota or whatever, and just drive there <laughs> hoping that they would have somebody around our way to pair us up with right that's yeah. crazy that is man that's like the old I, days. I i fought maybe 14 fights without signing a contract <laughs> 
no waivers, no nothing, no insurance. No Who knows? Insurance. I I fought twice in one night once in Minnesota. Uh, we went out there. They had a guy. We wait. We first off, we go into a hotel hotel room, and there's a bathroom scale in their bathroom, and we step on that. And he's like, "Yeah, I got somebody for you." <laughs> So like all right, good, I guess I guess I'll have somebody to fight. Yeah. yeah. So then we go the next day. I fight. I fight. I beat this guy. I choke him in in a minute and a half or something. And uh, I go back and I'm getting ready to take my gloves off. The promoter runs over to me and and says, "Oh, don't take those off." He's like, "I got another fight for you." Oh my god. <laughs> I'm like, but, uh, but at this point, had you had you been introduced to jujitsu at that point or? Um, how Mark was that? Mark Coleman was my jujitsu instructor. <laughs> out of town. So we were in. Yeah, we were in. Uh, Lafayette, my buddy Mo is actually out visiting me right now. Um, he was a bouncer at this famous bar there called Harry's. And uh, he would always get the tough guys coming through, watch UFC and whatever. And he'd talk to anybody who, who liked fighting or was interested in it. We'd try to get them to come and work out with us. So I was training for my first fight. And we had, it was about eight guys, I think, lined up on the wall. They came in. And uh, I was going to do five-minute rounds grappling with them. And yeah. as I submitted them, a new guy would come in so they would get a rest. Yeah. After about three and a half minutes of the first round, they were all done. <laughs> they all quit. <laughs> they all quit. That was, that's why I had to do the rest of the time on a bike because I, I didn't have anybody else to train with. To, to but just bu- they just bugged out? or you Yeah, they just stayed on the wall like, no, I can't go again. Yeah, fuck this. And I didn't, know, there, right? I didn't know anything about submissions. Like Coleman, Mark Coleman and, and Tom Erickson were showing me submissions. <laughs> Right, so you're laughing. Why? Because Mark Coleman was a, a slick jujitsu yes, exactly, stylist. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Coleman's only submission is the can opener. Right? Yeah. Oh, right. Where you just on top and yeah. then you just pull the head and try to. Erickson like break the has neck a open. rape choke. I think submission. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought that was the one where you put both your hands right around the neck. <laughs> he, he's 300 pounds. He only needs oh, one. Geez. That's amazing. <laughs> they made that illegal after he did that. Right. Man, I remember the Mark Coleman can openers and the headbutts and yep. Mark Kerr, or the Kerr and, and the headbutts and oh my god, mm-hmm. the old days. So, so one day you're just like, all right, finally, fuck it, I'm gonna go out to California and just well, pile, you sit in the car and you drive out there. Or I start, I started fighting, and um, it wasn't going. I you know, lost my first fight and I won a couple, and I, I still kind of wasn't figuring it out. I still was hungry to do it, and you know, I started uh, driving to Eastern Illinois to uh, train a little bit with Brian Ebersol because he had more experience. Um, but, you know, it wasn't until I got, I, I went out for a month vacation, like during um, Thanksgiving. Me and Eversol flew out and stayed with Crazy Bob and Josh Thompson, slept on the floor and trained for a week. And I, I fell in love with the place. I was like, yeah, I have to, uh, I have to be training with these people. I have to get with these people. And, uh, is this AKA or is this AKA? Yeah. Okay. But I was Very a little bit, I was a little stubborn. So I was, I, I knew like I needed, for some reason I needed, I didn't want to disappoint my mom. I think I didn't want to not finish <laughs> grad school. I didn't want to disrespect I did, or, or the, that year, at least I didn't want to disrespect the scholarship because it could have went to somebody else. Right. And, uh, I was still a little bit of a pussy, I think. Yeah. I get out you of know, there. and then, well, and then because <laughs> some of it is like, you know, that crabs in the butt. People pull pull you down, not even on purpose. Like they, they yeah. want to hang out. They want to go to the bar. They want to they right. want to smoke. They want to drink. They want to do degenerate things. Right. Sleep in. And I was getting into that habit because like I I, I wasn't hanging around the younger guys really because I needed a separation because I was a volunteer coach. So I couldn't be like hanging out really with them. So I had other people, and uh, it just was a situation where I was like I, I need to in, immerse myself in MMA and get away from every distraction. I was like, so I was like, if I have no friends and no family around, nobody can bother me and expect me to do anything other than train. So I, I moved to California also to kind of create that situation. It's just, I isolated myself. It was just me and jujitsu and, and MMA and fighting. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't think people appreciate the uh, required solitude in some ways that a, a fighter has to have. I mean, look, I, I'm going to just be straight. Like my combat sports experience are limited to uh, Muay Thai and like four amateur fights. Mm-hmm. I won all of them, by the way. Uh, and I won a WKA North American amateur kick, uh, Muay Thai championship. Awesome. Got the medals. Uh, but, you know, and even even for those, man, like the training camps that we would put ourselves through, you're just mm-hmm. you're there every day. You're there for hours a day. And it's the only thing you can think of. You're yep. thinking about it constantly because you're not eating and you're trying to lose weight and you're trying to recover. There's just no time uh, in the day you're, for fucking around. You're on call. You're you're at work for the eight to 10 weeks or 12 weeks that you're on in camp. 
There's not really right. not really a day off. Even your day off is should be structured in a way to benefit and push you forward for the fight. Right. I don't think people give uh, fighters, MMA fighters, enough credit for that type of sort of uh, discipline and mental fortitude. I mean, it, it's easy, and especially in the old days, it was easy to disregard people as just being sort of brutes and stuff. But yeah. as you were getting into the game, things were really starting to evolve, right? Yeah. Like uh, jujitsu became much more prominent. Everybody was starting to learn how to box, how to wrestle, how to do jujitsu, yeah. how to do Muay Thai and whatnot. More complete you, fighters everywhere. Mm, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, and real athletes too. Yep. And training like real athletes. I mean, you know, I can imagine some of those fights that you did the farm circuit, you know, some of those early UFCs look like they were doing, you know, some of the same things too. Like guys coming in all fat and out of shape mm-hmm. and gassing in 30 seconds. Or <laughs> I had, uh, when I fought in Iowa, extreme challenge, whatever, there's a guy, Jeremy Horn. I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. Jeremy yeah, Horn. Yeah, of course, man. He, he was a grinder. He was the ref. But like he... <laughs> He had on like a wife beater and like baggy <laughs> cargo shorts and yeah. I don't you know like Dude, he looked like he looked like a homeless guy. Right. He looked like a homeless guy. <laughs> my friends I showed the tape to. It was an amateur tournament or whatever. Uh, they were like, "Why is a homeless guy umpiring <laughs> here? Like refing your fight? Like why is he in the cage?" Yeah. It's like that guy's like one of the best ground fighters around. Like whatever, right. whatever. I think my first introduction to him was he fought uh, Chuck Liddell yeah, Chuck, like, no. sometime around the like Randy and Tito sagas and such. Um, oh, was man, it the I second to... one? Like he choked yeah, him the one second, time. Or... The second, second time. Yeah. One. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like I lost touch with the UFC at the same time everybody else did, like after 10 or 12 or 14 or something like that. And then one day it just came yeah. back. It was like 37 or 38. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh man, it was totally repackaged. And I got back into it. But, uh, so, all right, let's go. You're in California. You go out there. You get hooked up with AKA, and then all of a sudden, what happens? You just all of a sudden, someone just hands you uh, a big fat contract, or you? Just, no, you I mean you. Uh, you really have to, yeah. You see in the book like uh, how much of a wild west it was, and there's a lot of. That's one of the things I really like about the book. It, it's a time capsule of like us building uh, the methods of how people train and do things in the sport. There's there's a lot of things, not, it wasn't just our gym, but there's a lot of gyms that were big gyms that created things that other people bit off of, mm. uh, because they worked. So, right. you know, the training strategies, the styles, the, you know, not just the techniques, but the way of training and conditioning and getting ready for fights that all, that all was being developed in those early 2000 years. And can uh, you, can a you lot talk a little bit about book. that? Like, uh, uh, what, what, what would you, how would you characterize like the training methods? So how are they, how one, are they different? one of the things that uh, is in the book is, you know, I, I, I'm a big advocate of lifting weights. I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, but lifting weights the way I did in, in high school and college was kind of, uh, geared for bodybuilding and football. Okay. Right. So short term explosive, it wasn't built for, you know, endurance type stuff. Right. Um, so there's much more recovery needed for those types of lifts. So when I went out to California, I'm doing those types of lifts and trying to do jujitsu, then I'm a mate training and jujitsu again. And then some kind of mid trainer was like three or four workouts in that day. Plus the, the, the weight training, like I couldn't do it. The body couldn't handle it. The body doesn't have any time to recover. So I stopped lifting and then that transferred into, uh, we started doing CrossFit. It's like hmm. 2003. It's like there's only a few CrossFits around. We had to drive to Santa Cruz to go do it. We had to drive half hour in the morning to go do it. So we really liked some of the the, the, the training stuff that was done in the in the CrossFit. But the CrossFit's like its own sport. You do that right. and you're wiped out the rest of the day. Right. So we had to stop I, doing that. And we I've done to, CrossFit a long time. I would do the 12 o'clock and I'd come back at 1.30 and I'd be like, man, I'm done. I just want to take a yeah. nap. I'm so right. like, you know, we would do that and then jiu-jitsu and then training and sparring like it just we were done there's nothing so that we stopped that but we started taking things from those workouts and, and putting them together and like i didn't get back to lifting weights again and finding a good way to do it until like 2013 i think is when i finally i finally figured out the way to do it right for mma in my opinion um but yeah so like there's things like that that were developed our, our cardio we have this bike workout that that that, that, that I think everybody does now. It's a circuit training bike workout. And uh, that kind of came stemmed from AKA and us taking some stuff from CrossFit and putting it together. Um, so you guys do spin class? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, I have a video on my YouTube, official John Fitch YouTube page. And yeah. uh, 
it's it's a it's a sample of a bike workout and it's only 15 minutes but it's um one minute sprint on the bike one minute like box jumps one minute of some other thing and then you go back to the bike and Dang. You do that and it'll 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 kill you it'll kill right. you and it'll lead to more and better body composition than, oh, than like running a mile right yeah well the sprint and sure so mma is interesting because you also you have to have that explosive power but yep. you need that grinding endurance too so yep. it must be hard to really balance that out huh? yes and a lot of guys are just way too lazy to condition themselves to handle it and that's why i like to fight inside yeah. Uh, 99.9% of the guys out there will get exhausted in a 30 second arm hand fight with me. Right. Like they're just not used to it. Right. Much less you on top of them on the ground, pounding them in the face. Well, that's, that's when they start getting really tired. Then I start taking them down and yeah, beating them up on the ground. When, when you get a guy down on the ground, can you tell, can you tell when they like, they give up? Um, I mean, yes, you can you can tell when the guy's kind of given up, but things have changed. Like sometime around 2008, the UFC started pushing commissions and uh, referees to start standing fights up faster. Right. It used to be if you got taken down, the only way to get up was if you submitted the guy, you swept the guy, or you fought up and got to your feet. Right. Now they they started changing things so that if you can hold on to the guy, if you keep your guard closed and you can hold on to his arms long enough and stop all action, the ref will stop you up and reward you. Right. Um, so it used to be guys kind of would give up a submission to give, to get out of the fight because they couldn't get away. Right. Then stick an arm up in the air, they stick their neck out, stick yeah. an arm out. Yeah. Basically right. that's the easy one is just make, put your head out in a bad position and then right. you're, you're, well, not, I, you're not getting punched anymore. But from then the outsider's perspective, that looks like the most terrifying position in the whole world to be yeah. in. But when you get guys who get rewarded for not fighting, for stopping the fight, then it slows things down. And so now I can feel when I've broken the guy, but he's not giving me the submission. He's not sticking his neck out. He's holding on. And he's just trying Got to it. shut me down until the ref stands me up. Got it. That must be frustrating for you. It's guy very too. frustrating because I'm the one who gets blamed for it. Right, right. You, you, it looks like you're slowing down the action, yeah, but really like, they're just holding so on from your life. I get criticized for being a boring fighter, but... I am still currently number two all-time strikes in the UFC since UFC 28 when they no started kidding. recording these things. Yes, for like just quantity of strikes. Number landed. of strikes landed. I'm number yeah. two, and that was wow. and that was only 18 fights, in seven and a half only. years only. Only. You got guys right now are fighting 33 times. They're not beating me. Right. Uh, it's uh, GSP is number one, and Frankie Edgar I think is number three. Oh right, just at the the work rate. Yep, number of strikes. So, like, I'm not, how can you land that many punches or strikes if you're holding on to someone? Right. Oh man. All right. Well, let's let's get into that, man. Let's talk about let's talk about the run. Like, let's talk about those fights. I think the first time that I uh, really saw you fight was at Thiago Alves fight on a UFC Fight Night, like maybe number five or six or something mm. like that. So, yeah, that, it was an early one. Yeah, and that was back when those UFC fight nights were like a big event. It felt yeah. like all my friends we would like come mm -hmm. you know, have a party just to yeah, watch. Yeah, it was. Those. I mean, it was yeah, it was free TV. It was a free yeah. yeah. So like, it was the first it was tons time. of tons of viewership. Yeah, and that Thiago Silva, man, that dude was huge. It looked Al Alves, like, Alves, Alves, right? Yeah. Sorry, Alves. He was like uh, really Thick. top heavy, if yeah. I remember. Thick dude. Yeah, and uh, so let, let's talk about that. I mean, talk about your run through there. You were. You were just killing people. What did you win? Like five, six, seven fights in a row, something like that, to get there? I won eight UFC fights in a row in order to get the title shot with GSP. It was like my fourteenth win in a row, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, how were you? How were you feeling through that run, man? Good. Like I was on mission. I knew that you know it was my destiny to win. It was my destiny to be champ. Like I was mm. better than these guys. I knew I was going to win. Uh, I put in the time and the effort, the work, you know, I didn't, I didn't go out. I didn't party. Like, it's funny. Like I've been in San Jose for 16 years. Um, I'm, I'm just starting to learn my way around. Right. <laughs> you know, because you the gym, oh, yep. That's all I ever did was go to the gym, go to the store. Like right. I didn't go out. I didn't go downtown. I didn't, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything social. Like I, I don't have that many local friends outside of the gym because right. I just don't. I'm just starting to do that now. This last past year, I'm just starting to make friends that aren't fighters. <laughs> right. So, uh, 
I, I worked in San Jose. It was my workplace. <laughs> I partied and did stuff with friends and whatever when I was traveling at events or fights or whatever. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of, you know, I was so obsessed. It had, it was obsessed. It was the only word you could, you could use for it. Obsession. Right. Absolute pure obsession. I mean, that, that's the only way to get anything <coughs> real done. I, I know that when I, yes. I, I have like fits of, of work where I'll, I'll work like 80, 90 hours a week just, you know, for like weeks to get stuff done, get up at three 30 in the morning and mm. write and write and write and write and write. And the, the only way to get anything real done is to just put your head down and block everything else out, which yeah. isn't really good for socializing. Isn't good for your relationships. Isn't, isn't good for anything monk else. mode. Yeah. Monk mode's important, but it, yeah, it's dangerous to get locked away too long. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, t- what, at what point in your career did you, or have, did you ever, I don't know, like, does the, does the stress, do the nerves, does anxiety ever go away? You no. know, when you come out of the, the dressing room, is it, is it still it's, there again? This is the best way I can, I can explain it, right? Um, even though I've never gone skydiving, <laughs> I would say it, it's probably something similar, right? Because you're. You go through this process of putting on the chute and getting everything ready. You get into the plane. You hear it fire up. You hear it start to move. You go up in the air, right, all the way to, like, standing at the edge. Like, right. it's basically what it is. And right. it's like you're in the tunnel getting ready to be announced. And it's like when they announce you, you just step out into the into the, into the the air and you're free right. falling. Except it's different because there's, like, branches on your way down. <laughs> and there's a good chance you're going to hit one if not all of them. Right. So right. it's going to hurt. It's going to be scary yeah. and it's going to hurt. Uh, Cause even, even in a one punch knockout, like there's a good chance you'll hurt your hand or your wrist. Right. Yeah. Like, exactly. so, you know, you know what's going to happen, but you just have to step out into the, into the abyss anyways. Do you have like a pre-fight ritual? Do you have uh, mantras? Do you, do you meditate? Do you zone Pull out? the trigger on the wall? Pull the trigger. Pull the trigger. Yep. Always be moving. That's your mantra. Pull the trigger. Yep. I mean, keep it simple for life. So yeah, uh, pull the trigger, always be moving. Those are good ones. And then what I like to do for a fight is, uh, I like to break strategies or things down into like threes, right? So I'll have three on the feet, three on the ground. That way I'm not overwhelmed with techniques. That way my strategy is general. Right? So like one thing I can focus on is don't get hit. Right. Hands right? up. Yeah. Hand, we will don't get hit. So that's you, you, you're, you're moving. That's a conscious thing. Oh, it's right. Don't get, don't get hit. Don't get hit. Don't get hit. Right. Um, uh, hit him with the right. right. Maybe I know that the guy's susceptible to the right hands. Or I'm going to use the right hand to set up a shot. Or put myself in position. So I'm like, move. don't get hit. Hit him with the right. Don't, don't. You're right. So I got two things going through my head. I make a miss. Boom. There's the right. Oh, okay. Um, right. And then three could be close the distance. Right. So then I'm, right. I'm in on him. So I have three things, and that's all I'm trying to do in that round is don't get hit. Hit him with the right and close the distance. A lot of other stuff will happen off of that, but I don't. I don't really need to be overwhelming myself with a hundred things I could be doing. Okay, parry right. the parry the jab, move left, and throw this. Right. Like right. it's too much. You can't process that fast. Right. So I try to keep those things simple, and then the same thing will be on the ground. Right. If I'm on, if I if I get put on my back, get away. <laughs> right. Get up. Get up. I, I program into my body, so I don't have to think about that more. Actually, if I lay on my back, my first motion is get up, get away. Get up, right. get away, or get on top, right? Um, but then, you know, it's, okay, go to this position, look look for damage. Or go to that position, look for damage. Be aware of this. So I'll, I'll do the same thing. And it keeps things really simple, and it keeps you on task, and uh, it keeps you from being overwhelmed. I like that, man. And guys who are listening, you can take that same advice and apply it to whatever you're doing. Like, for me, I'm just thinking about, like, write daily. <laughs> you know, like, I got to keep things simple. I got to I gotta write daily. Got to generate content daily. I got to tweet daily. So these are things, these are mantras that I have too, that I have like, I've got a whiteboard up here and I've just got it written all over the board. Like these are the things I, I got to do yeah. every single day. But I mean, I, I, I'm trying to switch gears to, from the fighting mindset of that and try to switch it into some of this other stuff, some of the social media stuff, some of this, you know, podcasting stuff. Right. So that's well, I want to, I want to get to all of that now. I want to, I just want to wrap up this conversation about like how to, how to manage the nerves and stuff. Okay. Like, I so, remember... and then, and then the biggest thing I can say about managing the nerves is, is being prepared, yeah. right? Do the work. If you did the work, you know, you did the work. It makes things a lot easier. 
to right. be ready. And then, um, oh man. You know, I can use this advice for myself with like public speaking. Every time I have a public speaking event, I'm like, oh, you know what? I know what I want to say. I'll just, I'll just wing it. And then like a, a day and a half before, I'm like, oh God, no, no, I can't do that. And then I start preparing and preparing and preparing. And then afterwards, I'm like, fuck, if I only just would have prepared a little bit longer, it would have gone that much better. And I would have been a lot less nervous, right? If you do the work and you're prepared, mm-hmm. the nerves, the nerves tend to go away. And I guess that's uh, applicable across the board for yeah. anything. That you're but it's doing. also uh, part of like programming. You're, you're programming. Your mind's a computer. Your body's the, the machine. You've got to program it. So being prepared is, oh, I, I, my, the machine's ready to go. I've got all the code written. I just press the button and it goes. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, for people who don't know, I mean, boxers and, and kickboxers and whatever. You, I mean, and even ground guys too. You just drill, drill and drill and drill and drill and drill over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And over and then over again some yep. more so that you don't even ever have to think about yep. it, right? 30 years later, you're still drilling the same thing. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. I still drill my one, double two, legs. One, two, three. One, yep. two, three. So, one, and two, then three. and then another part is the visualization. And that's part of go. the, that's part of the doing the work. Okay. Sometimes I forget so, to mention it because I, I consider that part of the work too. Tell me, tell me about that, man. This is it's, really important. Yeah, it's, it's mental drilling. You have to... Um, be able to put yourself there. You need to transport yourself to the fight, to the situation. You need to feel it, smell it, hear it. Like you should get the goosebumps when when you imagine yourself getting to the tunnel and, and all that stuff. You want to mimic the physiological response in your body um, as you're visualizing it that you're going to have when you actually compete. That way your body's normal. That way everything you're feeling is normal. And you've already been through it. And uh, we tend to have more fear when we're facing something that's unknown. Mm -hmm. Well, if you visualize yourself through it over and over and over again, it becomes known, even though even though it's just, you know, in your memory. How do you how do you do that? Practice. I don't know where I learned to do that, but I've always I've always been able to transport myself. I don't know if I was a little kid and I could daydream really well, but it made it came from that, but then it started turning into more specific controlled daydreaming and, uh, and really transporting myself to a new location. I was I'm and there. You, and you like sit down in a chair, close your eyes or something. And just like literally, I, like it, it was a problem sometimes because there'd be times I was driving. I had to get mm. control over it after a while. Cause there'd be times I'd be driving and all of a sudden my grip would tighten and I'm going, mm, speeding up, and, you know, the girl I'm with is like, are you okay? What's going on? <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm getting into, like, a guilty, and I'm like, mm, I'm trying to finish, and I'm, you know, my whole body's flexing. I'm like, oh, yeah, wait, I'm not. I'm not right. actually there. So there's right. times that I have to, like, put time away, you know, when I'm laying down for bed or if I'm one, when I just want to rest. Maybe I'm in between workouts and I want to get arrested. I can lay down, you know, cross my arms on my chest and just breathe focus on breathing and then just start to visualize myself through the processes, put myself in, you know, a leg lock position I have to fight out of and, and, and make myself feel it, let myself feel it, let myself smell the sweat in the gym and whatever's going on. Yeah, man, guys, if guys are listening, this is really super important. It's, I think it's something that people dismiss oftentimes. It seems sort of hocus pocus or whatever, but there really is something to be said for for really trying hard to imagine what it's like to be in those situations and to really feel it and to visualize your success. Mm-hmm. I heard a I heard a famous pitcher once say that uh, someone asked him. He's like, how 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 do you throw strikes and strike everybody out all the time? He's like, well, I just every night before I go to bed, I just close my eyes and dream about striking everybody out on the whole team. Like, and you know, that's, that's what I tell mm-hmm. my 12 year old son to do is to just lay in yep. bed and think about throwing <clears throat> strikes, man. I mean, I think there's you know. been research that showed, uh, isn't it like mirror, mirror neurons, but there's neurons that will fire the same way. Yeah. Uh, if you're thinking about doing something, you, what, even if you're not physically doing it. So like you right. can, it's like you can train your, your motor neurons on that level through, through your thoughts. Right. Well, it's super important, and uh, all these things, uh, do the preparation, put in the work, keep it simple, have clear and concise directions for yourself, 
visualize and just practice, 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 practice. Mm. And then maybe, maybe after 10 years or 12 years, <laughs> you too can <laughs> you be, might get you too break. can be world-class. <laughs> you might get to break. Well, yeah, break. I mean that, that is uh, something else to be said, which is that like showing up every day Show is, a, is like up. half the, half the way to win. Mm. Um, nobody wins without, without showing up. Yeah. Um, and you know, one of the biggest things I've learned and had to deal with in the last year, I think the most it's helped a lot is, being outcome independent. Mm, that's, I've heard that phrase before. Really hard. Yeah. Because you, tell, tell me what you mean by that. Okay. So, okay. I'm a uh, fight training. My last fight was for a world title against uh, uh, Rory McDonald. Right. Um, <clears throat> it was important to me to train my ass off to win that title. I wanted that title. I wanted to win. I wanted the money. I wanted the opportunities to have that. Okay. Well, I put everything I had to into the training camp. I put everything I had to into the fight, into my diet, into the preparation, everything. I did the best I could. I fought the hardest I could. I think I won the fight. The judges said it was a draw. Right. Well, if I'm outcome dependent, I'm crushed, absolutely crushed that I put in all of this work and I didn't get my outcome. Mm. Maybe even suicidal because I didn't get what I had put my life into mm. if you can be outcome independent if you cannot care well i gave my best effort and then move along that's powerful and that's that's where i'm at now so compare compare your reaction to the rory fight and the gsp fight like how how did you i went and you feel different after the gsp fight I went to a deep depression and I had to go to, I had to escape to Thailand to get my shit together. Mm. I had to immerse myself to, to put myself in a place to be mentally ready to make the run again. Yeah. Um, I was laughing after the Rory fight. I was making jokes. Really? <laughs> yeah. Went to that's the, amazing. Went to the after party, had a great time. Those are like, that, that's like 10 years apart, these fights, right? Basically. Yeah, pretty much 10, 11 years apart. Yeah. So after you, after we just passed the 11 year anniversary of the GSP fight, actually, it was the ninth, I think. Jeez Louise. Man, we're both getting old, John. Yeah, I didn't even know it. It came up on my timeline on something. I was like, oh. (laughs) So, uh, what do you, what do you attribute? So, this is outcome independence, but like, how do you foster, how do you foster that difference? Because, guys, listen, everybody is going to try hard and fail in life. Uh, happens to if you're not failing you're not trying and if you're not trying you're not winning so like failure learning how to deal with failure mm-hmm. is and i've written about this too it's like Resilience. i call it uh, how, how to make a comeback it's like you have to learn how to make a comeback otherwise you're never going to be successful yeah. and it's like something that people don't talk about a whole lot um you know you said after the gsp which is, people don't know george st pierre uh he was the champ um, at the same weight class as John was at 170. Right? Arguably the greatest MMA fighter. Yeah? Arguably. You could you could easily make a case for him being the number one pound for pound guy ever. Ever. I mean, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I found him to be super exciting and totally super weird. Did you, by the way, did you catch that uh, Joe Rogan podcast he did where he thinks that he's being abducted by aliens? What do you I, think I didn't. About? I heard about it. I didn't, I didn't watch it. But. That's weird. That was weird. But uh, so you go from... <laughs> One reaction to losing something like, you know, you're on this long run, you're training for years, mm-hmm. you get to the championship fight, you lose that, you like totally crushed and like have to go all the way around the world to Thailand, which I've actually done the exact same thing myself after my divorce, did the same thing, went to Thailand, trained Muay Thai for a few weeks and did free diving. Uh, and it really worked mm-hmm. um, uh, to clear my mind and to refocus things. Be good to and, I- isolate, but... Uh, be productive, kind of put your, yourself into something that you're, you're doing, I guess. Like, don't isolate right. and, and shut everybody off and stay in your house. <laughs> That's, right. Yeah, that, right. That, that just steamrolls into something bad. And then, ten, and then 10 years later, you have a similar experience, but instead you're just laughing. And you're attributing this to mindset, right? Mm-hmm. It's just about controlling your oh, mind. Oh, look, mindset. I mean, and I, 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 I kind of was on a great path and they kind of lost my way for a little while. Cause I, one of the, one of the things that set me on the path to, uh, you know, California and this fighting stuff was a book called, uh, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Yeah. I read that. Right. And the basic thing out of that book was, uh, be in the moment, right. It's about the path and the journey has nothing to do with the, with the destination. Right. And I was on that for a while, but then I, 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 
I got a taste of that belt and that belt swagger and and what it could do and the power it gave you and the money and whatever. I, I got a little bit of that. And then that became a little bit ego driven. That's why that book is failing upward or death by ego. Because <laughs> right. there's been, you know, the mistakes and downfalls a lot of, along the way, I think were heavily attributed to ego. And um, yeah, I, you know, it's, a, it's this book supposed to be one of a series. So we still don't know how it's going to end. We don't know. We still don't know. We don't know if it's going to be triumphant me failing upward or if I'm going to end up killing myself with ego. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, continue to fail upward, please, sir. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, you talk about the ego and the power and the stuff. I imagine it must be very alluring. I mean, uh, not only yeah. is well, the you, fame, you get invited to, uh, special events with special investors and money. People you get to go to the special topless bar, get, a, get invited to a special meal. Everything's right. catered, taken care of famous people come over and talk to you like they 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 make sure you get a taste of what it's going to be like because mm. they want to rope you in and they want to control you and okay. my mindset switched from i just want to be the greatest martial artist i can be to right. i've got to be the ufc champ oh. precious precious <laughs> <laughs> did you really did you really feel like that dude like i i know my mindset switched from that and i bet okay. i'll be able to pick it up through the books because i only went through one journal i've got a few more i've got more to go through so like i'm willing to bet that because i haven't read any of these since i wrote them down like I, yeah. at the time i looked through them so there's at least five to seven years time at all that i've looked through any of these wow so like some of the stuff that i'm reading through is like you know bringing me back like oh man and then i'm wondering when the attitude's going to change but it's going to be in there, I think. So you you journaled all through the run and the UFC and the yep. GSP fight yep. and all that. From uh, I went, you know, two thousand that summer, and then I started again in two thousand three before I moved to California. So wow. two thousand three all the way through probably two thousand thirteen, two thousand fourteen uh, was pretty much almost daily. Wow. Uh, and then I started having issues and personal issues and stuff and. I just noticed that a lot of the stuff I was writing in my journal was negative mm. and I didn't want to face it. So I think I mm. just stopped writing. I, mm. I'm still, I'm guessing because I'm, I want this stuff to come to me as I re-explore the journals. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I kind of have a feeling that I, I didn't because the, the journals keep you accountable, really keep you accountable. And I, I think at that time I was not feeling it. <laughs> like I didn't yeah. want to hold myself accountable with some of the things that were going wrong. Right. That's the interesting thing about it, man. When you most need it is probably the time you're least likely to yeah. do it. Oh, I don't have time to do that right now. I've, I've got to change a diaper. Can't, I right. can't write about how I'm feeling. Yeah. And I'm so dumb. I get the same way about like meditating too. I'm like, dude, it's just 10 minutes, bro. So just like 10 minutes. Why, why can't you just take 10 minutes to sit there and close your eyes and just chill out for a little bit? Because it seems like, I don't know, man, maybe there's a certain like fear of success or like fear of being happy or fear of being chilled out. Um, why, why I, I'm having my own therapy session here. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't I take those 10 minutes to, to meditate some days? You know, it's like, why wouldn't I take that time to journal when it really has such a huge impact? On it me? does. Yeah. Well, I imagine the allure of the fame of the UFC title was huge. The purse differential between the champ and That's the, the big one too. Yeah. If you get pay-per-view points. Yeah. Right. That's like almost having equity in the thing in some yep. ways. And, uh, and it's, it really, still, it's still only like 13% of the revenues. <laughs> what the uh, fighter purses are. The, 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 even the most well-paid guys are being robbed. <laughs> like right. blatantly robbed. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, later later on in your, in your UFC and MMA career, you not only you know, got your mind right, but then you started thinking about the sport in general, right? And you've gotten involved now in lawsuits, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, sort of general advocacy for, for fighters and fighter benefits and rights and stuff. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, man, so right from the beginning, I could tell there was something off with the UFC and how they did business. It's, it didn't make any sense why this sporting organization treated its athletes this way and no one else did and it wasn't until um you know carlos newton uh former ufc champ started doing the groundwork to get some lawyers and people involved 
Uh, he found this guy, Rob Macy, who helped start the um, Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Association. It's been around over a decade. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of the, uh, the board. Um, but uh, we could tell that there's something wrong. And, and Carlos started, he's a smart guy, started studying, started figuring it out. And, you know, prize fighting has been around in the U.S. for over 100 years. And there's laws about prize, prize fighting, but they're not enforced uh, in MMA. Hmm. Um, there's some reason been a clear distinction made between boxing and MMA, even though they're both combat sports. They try to say they're not the same sport, but... That's interesting, because they're also generally regulated and sanctioned by the same Same bodies. bodies, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. That's one of the huh. points we make, too. Right. Uh and so, like the disparity, what you're talking about here is that, like, I, I so so at basically, the it's this um, recently, but no sport, no sport worldwide has this because uh, it's illegal because it, it prevents uh, competition, right? And that is uh, the event organizer or promoter is not allowed to own exclusive contracts and control the title, right? Got it. Because they have too much leverage. They have all the leverage. They get to decide who fights for the championships. They get to decide rankings. Uh, it doesn't have to do anything to do with skill. It has to do with how much money that promoter or event person is making. If you look at every sport, they all have, uh, you know, the NFL, NHL, uh, those are all NBA. Those are sanctioning bodies. The sanctioning body controls the title. The team owner is the promoter. He doesn't. Right. So you have each team as a promotion and you have a sanctioning body. Uh, this is different because it's not a combat sport, so the sanctioning body is also the regulator. They regulate the sport. Uh, we have a, uh athletic commission, which regulates the sport, and it's a conflict of interest for them to control uh, the title also. That's, that's what happened. Basically, in the late 1800s, the U.S. government said, no, promoters can't control titles anymore. So okay. uh, the athletic commissions took them over. And then the New York State Athletic Boxing title became the biggest one because it was the biggest state that had the most money. They're like, well, this this eliminates competition because all the boxers have to go to New York to fight in order to to win real money because it's the biggest title. And all the promotions and all promoters have to promote in New York because if they want to make money, they have to fight for the highest belt. So they're like, oh, it's it's not fair. It's not it's not a free market. So in the eight, 1925, the, uh, the New York State Athletic Commission created a sanctioning body license. And that's when the WBC, WBO, Got all it. those boxing titles popped up. Well, that, that's a huge advantage for those athletes to be able to fight for a promoter, have a title, and then be like, I don't want to work with you anymore. Leave right. and keep his title. And keep the title. We, we don't have right. that. You just you just sort of experienced this very same thing, just like uh, with uh, in the recent past, didn't you? Where you were uh, a title holder, and uh, and then there was like a new promoter came in. Yeah, and no, I was stripped of a title. Yeah, uh, I <laughs> you was know, Wikipedia because they changed says, their name. They changed their name, so I no longer I, I I went from World Series of Fighting champion to just another PFL contender overnight. Right. Well, you know, uh, I think Wikipedia or maybe ESPN has, has says. Uh, you vacated that title. Vacated. <laughs> it's horseshit, isn't it? Yeah, it I had is. already lost it. <laughs> oh they, man, because it disappeared. Because they they were no longer a promotion anymore. <laughs> like you st- right. like they even said they said that on the phone. They're like, "Well, you still are the World Series of Fighting champion. You will be forever, <laughs> forever." Because no one's ever going to fight. You're never going to fight before it ever again. <laughs> Well, I think this is something that most uh, casual UFC fans have no idea of that, um, you know, they, they have everything in-house and they control everything. Yep. And, and man, it, it take, gets it, take it or leave it contracts. Well, dude, I mean, some of those guys on the undercard last time I checked, and I don't know what it is now, but I remember they were getting like 2K to show and 2K to win. Well, now they, uh, since the lawsuit started, they've made changes to make themselves look better. So now okay. what they do is they, they do pay, uh, I think it's like 10 and 10 or 20 and 20 for, I think it's 10 and 10 for the start. It might be 20 and 20, but the low pay. So their low pay is higher, but their mid and top tier guys, you know, well, top tier guys are a very small amount of them. So the mid tier right. guys make a lot less, but they, they puff up the, uh, the numbers by paying the, uh, the entry level people more. Right. And even so, man, that's not even. Well, they, well, they don't. They Yeah. You fight for 20 and 20, but you only fight once a year. Right. That's not enough. You, you pay uh, 10% probably to management, 10% probably to the gym. And then you have all your training expenses like, right. and, and then taxes. So, you know, 
that 2020 is 40,000 turns into like 15, 17,000 real quick. Right. Uh, that's why you've got guys who are, gosh, if I remember, I, I haven't been like detailed up on UFC for a few years now, but I remember guys were like firefighters and yep. Rich Franklin was like a middle school math teacher, teacher or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chris Lytle, he's a fireman. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so like you, you couldn't even, you're supposed to be a full-time professional fighter, but you really, you really can't yeah. be. And then I was washing room. dishes up until I fought Diego Sanchez. <sighs> No kidding. Yeah. Man, that was a crazy fight, by the way. I was, I was making 200 bucks a night washing dishes. Diego Sanchez, that guy's a, that guy fought like a nutter. Yeah. Was he a nutter he still on, is fighting. Uh, off stage? He still is fighting. Yeah. He is fought it, was recently, he, I think. Was he, you know, as crazy off offline as he appears to he's, be? He's case? a unique guy. He's a character, that's for sure. He's a unique yeah. guy. So what do you see as the future for these uh, lawsuits and like a, a true like separation of the title? Well, we uh, are in our fifth year of our uh, one point, I think, four billion dollar antitrust lawsuit. Uh, if they lose because it is an antitrust case, they will have to be forced to pay treble. So it's geez. three times one point, yeah. I think one point two or one point four billion. Um yeah, so we start evidentiary hearings uh, at the end of this month. I think the 27th, wow. and I'll be going to Nevada to do that. So they're going to uh, take the experts from both sides and have a little mini trial there. And then from that, the judge will decide on class, and he will decide whether or not we uh, were equally damaged together as a class. If Got he it. doesn't, we can do a majority uh, suit, which we need like a few hundred guys to step forward and put their name down. Um, are you finding that current fighters are willing to put their name down? Um, man, I don't know, man. There's so much uh, Stockholm syndrome and fear from a lot mm -hmm. of these guys. There's a lot of some, some. There's a lot of these guys that just they just want daddy to pat them on the head and tell them good job. Yeah, and they would do anything for Dana to pat them on the head and tell them they did good. <laughs> they'd fight for free What's they'd fight for free and get brain damage for it what? just for a pat on the head Dana said I did a good job what's your relationship wow. like with Dana White I don't have one I've never really spoken with him hmm. like I don't Even I don't choose to get I don't, yeah I don't choose to get close to snakes like I can you can I'm a pretty good reader character I don't need to uh, yeah I don't I don't know I need to put myself around it I'm, and I imagine if if he has that that bit to him, it's only gotten worse since the days where they were making no money to now. Exactly. So has, one has, of the, one of the big things that defined my opinion of him was when I was fighting Diego. It was the first time they did a like a feature thing on Spike. I can't even say a free pre fight video, whatever. Yeah. You know, so like we each got you know ten minutes or whatever, and they walk up in and. They announced me, and the, 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 it was the weigh-ins, and the crowd you know, yells, and, and uh, Dana leans over to me and says, you see, we can make you a star. You see what a little, <laughs> that was just one whatever. It was just, that was just one whatever preview. We see what we can do for you. Like, literally, straight up just telling me, like, play ball, and we'll make you famous. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how well you can fight. Just do the right things, and we'll, we'll make your, your, your rise cushy. Right. That, to me, that was insulting and distasteful. It's like, Interesting. It's like I don't want your help. I don't want you to push right. me forward. I just want to fight. Right. That must be very frustrating to feel like uh, your destiny is sort of out of your own hands at that point. Huh? It, that yeah, that was a horrible feeling. Like uh, the second time I fought Tiago, I it was supposed to be a title for a title fight, title contention. The winner was supposed to go fight GSP next. Well. I fought the fight. I dominated. I thought I performed well. It's one of my. It's on my list of one of my best performances. And afterwards at the press conference, they took the the title shot away. Mm. They took it away, and uh, they started pushing this. That's when they really started pushing hard on the uh, excitement over winning. Oh, is that when the boring John Fitch? Yeah, that's when started? it started. Was leading up to that fight. Was well, he maybe he wins fights, but he's boring, so he doesn't deserve a title shot. Like hmm. that was the argument, and they started pushing that that some reason that you know entertainment is way more important than than skill. What? How do you think that the? There's obviously just the super casual UFC fan who doesn't really know anything, just mm -hmm. wants to see dudes get beat up. Yep. 
But I think that there's a pretty solid class of guys out there and fans that understand understand the sport. Yeah. And I and I would say that your style what may have not been as flashy as others, but it wasn't it, ever it wasn't, safe. It wasn't much different than GSP's. It re- well, he had some of those, uh, you know, karate kicks. A couple, and stuff. a couple here and there, but <laughs> I had a couple. I have, I have a few good kicks here and there. But like <laughs> one of the things I also started to realize was, especially after the GSP fight, was that, um, like no matter, like well, it wasn't before that, but no matter what you did, you weren't going to get any real money out of sacrificing yourself. Like that was one of the big things why I lost the title shot or whatever after that thing was. They wanted to try to make me fight uh, Josh Koshek, who was my training partner. Oof. Right? And I was like, it's like, why am I going to train my fight my training partner? Like, if he wins the belt, okay. Like, we're fighting for a belt. But, like, you're not going to pay us anything that makes it worth losing a training partner over. Like, right. over a long period of time, like, we'll make more money training together than, you know, destroying our friendship or training bond, whatever, by right. fighting. So, like, it's like, you're throwing an extra 100000 or half a million down on it. It doesn't really do shit for me it's like if you gave me pay-per-view points okay we'll right. fight we'll sell the shit out of it <laughs> give me pay-per-view points but they're not gonna do that right you still train with him is he still around he's retired him? and he's in um north carolina he's doing his company check defense so he's doing some uh military contract work oh interesting interesting yeah, well one of our sponsors is oak grove technologies and they're a big um government contractor one of the things i never really liked about that critique of you is like i was saying your style is not flashy but it's not safe like there's a lot of guys that fight safe Mm -hmm. you seem like you're always going forward (laughs) yeah i mean it's not a secret i'm gonna go forward close the distance put you in the in the corner of the fence in the mat and beat the crap out of you that's what i'm going to do (laughs) like don't get don't get hit close the distance yeah don't get hit close the distance (laughs) i'm gonna put you in the worst spot possible and i'm gonna hit you and elbow you and that's yeah. just what I want to do. If you can stop it, well, good for you. But most guys don't. <laughs> well, I like I like what I've learned about you here today. I mean, you're a very thoughtful guy. Uh, you spend a lot of time writing. You've written your own book. You spend time journaling. You focus on the mindset and the visualization aspects. You've done a lot of training of your own mentality in order to overcome adversity. Uh, and then you've gotten involved in advocacy and lawsuits and thinking about the big picture and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, I, I think that to me that, that really rounds out, uh, the image that I had of you, which was, you know, whew, just terrifying and scary and fun to watch. Um, but what does this, what, where is all this going for you? What is a, what is a post fight John Fitch world look like for you? I'm trying to figure that out. Um, I'm trying to fix my body up a little bit this month. I moved into a new place and I've been spending some time working on this. And then this month I'm doing a lot of yoga and stretching and feeling some stuff out. And then after this month, I want to see how I feel. And then there's a good chance I'll, I'm going to fight again. Yeah. Um, but I'm also working towards uh, more of an online presence, you know, interacting more, writing more, more books. I'm working on a, you know, I have more of the, the journal books to come out with. And uh, I'm working on a, a weight cutting book actually too. I want to sell cheap just because so many people have no idea what they're doing with cutting weight. Actually weight cutting or just not the, being fat? Uh, the weight cutting. Actually the weight yeah. cutting. Like my 8 to 12 week process. Like what I do to make sure that I'm, you know, in shape, look great, and feel great. So <laughs> yeah, just, so to, uh, yeah. I, I'm an advocate for yoga. I like to do Ashtanga yoga. Um, I'm happy to hear you mention it. I've been, what, what I've been do doing the hot the benefit? yoga the last couple of weeks. Uh, well, I just want to see if it can, like, I can't straighten my elbows out anymore. I have stuff in my elbows. They hurt. And uh, I just want to see if something like that and some rehab and some lifting can can put myself in a position to do another training camp. If not, I might, I might have to uh, get surgery. I might have to get some things removed from, from my joints. And I don't want to do that because I'm 41 and recovering from the incision sometimes is worse than the injury. Right, right. What is what is a regular day to day John Fitch workout look like? Oh man, like when I'm when I'm training for a fight. Uh, no, no, not fight oh, camp. Oh, now not fight camp, just like regular. Yeah. Um, I've been getting. I usually get up in the morning. I lift. I have a in my johnfish.net. Uh, I have a blog about my lifting. I say you should lift like um, it's a part of your hygiene. Right. Right. So I'm not worried about going to failure. I just want to do a steady amount of weight for my size, 
explosively, consistently over a number of years. When you say explosive, what does that mean? Does it mean like snatch? I don't want to go, I don't want to do slow burns. I want to press it, boom. I want it to come out like a punch. I want, uh, I had a, a strength conditioning coach for, he, was, he works for the uh, San Jose Sharks, Mike Crenza. Um, he had an accelerometer on his, he would, he would tie an accelerometer onto the bars and he'd measure how fast. And he wanted to measure to make sure that you were increasing in speed through the press. Mm. So it would have to be like, I don't know, you do your first one, it would measure like 90%, whatever. So as long as you're in a certain range, it would be clear, but it would beep. It would beep and shame you when <laughs> you you weren't explosive enough. Got it. So I focused now, a little bit more fight, on that explosive. Is that fight specific training or is that something um, people advocate just for general fitness? I think it's I think it's uh, for me it's it's just the martial arts way of training because you usually have so much other stuff to do throughout the day. You can't go to failure. How can you go to failure in squats and then do more workouts? Or even if you what if you work construction? You're gonna go to failure at five thirty right. in the morning and you're gonna go to the job site? Get right. out of here. Like right. it's just not reasonable. And unless right. you're a competitive lifter, I don't see a reason to do it. So I think something that's basic, easy to do every day. So I'll get up in the morning at five thirty, I'll bust out my lift, eat breakfast. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to come up with like a fifteen minute uh, yoga routine to warm up before the lift, I think. Mm-hmm. Um but that's that's the big thing I do now, and then I'm going to get an assault bike or uh, aerodyne so I can I can do my weekly uh, meditation, which is my cardio, <laughs> your, spin, your spin class. Yeah, spin class. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, you mentioned it online. So like uh, the the glory of Twitter uh, brought us together. You know, there's no way that I would ever have met you otherwise. Uh, and I've seen you sort of uh, up in the mix with a lot of the the guys on our side of Twitter and whatnot. And uh, the how, rational, how did you... rational thinkers, <laughs> rational <laughs> thinkers who believe in biology and believe, believe in evidence. Yes, I'm going to make some me- mega shirts. Make evidence great again. Oh, that's <laughs> make science great again. Make that's science. perfect. So, how, um, did you get started with social media? Back, I remember UFC made a huge push to like get everybody out. Yeah, I got on it pretty quick, and I I think that's why I have a big following on Twitter is because I I was out early and I was I was tweeting political stuff early. Like I I kind of was a SJW at one point, but there was a point I was like, wait a minute, this shit's getting weird. Tell me about that, John. Um, about I th- I think it was around the time about? of. Uh, Man, the shooting was it? Where was the, sh- the the kid that got shot? Um, in Missouri was it Missouri? Oh, right, yeah. It was in, around uh, that time, and right, then right, right, stuff right. started getting really weird around then, and then it started going downhill. I think because I was up to date on the Occupy stuff, and I was you know Edward Snowden, Bitcoin, all these things. I was in in on it because I was always reading on my phone. Right, um, and so would you consider yourself in the past a Democrat? I born and raised. Uh, no, I was a. I was a life. Uh, not raised. I was my parents were Republican, but I uh, was a lifelong Democrat. Yes, I remember being in Catholic school and we had spirit buddies, right? So you were like second grade and you got a spirit buddy who was like you know years ahead of you, yeah, to hang out with. And he asked me. He was kind of a dorky kid. He asked me uh, what my uh, my politics were. I was like second grade. <laughs> I was like, I'm a Democrat. He's like, oh, he's like, I bet I don't think you are. I don't think like he, but I don't think I knew what it meant. But yeah, um, yeah. So then I was, I was a big Bill Bill Clinton fan. Thought he was great. Um, hated Bush. Thought he was terrible. Kind of pulled away from politics altogether because of that. But I also started to realize that all mainstream news media and a lot of media was fake because right. of uh, because of the Iraq War. And right. all those things surrounding that. So that made me distrust anything. You know, I always took everything with a grain of salt. If, if the media was saying something, I was like, eh, maybe, maybe the story has something to do with that, but it's probably not true. Um, and then I was a supporter of Obama until about three months into his presidency when he just didn't do anything he said he was. And I was like, ah, oh, they got us again. Yeah. He got us again. I was like, all right, no more. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to let that happen again. And uh, started becoming a big Ron Paul fan. Got yeah. it. Yeah, that's sort of the gateway. Yeah, and then you had libertarianism. Then you had the Snowden and all that other stuff popping up, and uh, I had enough. 
nonsense. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you and I, you, you did a very thoughtful sort of review. I, I watched it, the video review of uh, Democrat to the Poor Bowl, mm-hmm. and I really appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's interesting how our lives have, we're basically the same age. We've mm-hmm. become from the same city, yep. and we had similar experiences in terms of the politics and the awakening. We're, we were raised to believe that men and women can do whatever they want, that yeah. your skin color doesn't matter. The gen- yeah. That your, your your genitals and what you do with them don't matter, like at right. all. Like that's what right. we were taught. And then now we're bad if we don't think they matter. Like you have to put weight on those things. It's it's bizarre and one hundred percent backwards to what we we were taught and brought up as. Right. Yeah, I had a tweet the other day do pretty well that was like Gen X, the only generation ever raised to believe, you know, to so. not think about gender and race. Yeah. Right. You know, like everybody before us was thinking about it and sort of in, in the negative ways and sort of like trying to get people rights, which is a good thing. And then afterwards, after us, now they're all just talking about it constantly, harping on it constantly. And it's been such a, a whipsaw, uh, at least from my perspective. I mean, I, I don't know what it's like for prior generations, but it really seems like everything changed really fast. Uh, and it changed like, you know, starting to me, it seemed like around 2000, I became aware like 2014 or so, and then everything just sort of whipped around yeah. and, and then, and then here we are. And, uh, it, it's been, a it's been really challenging for a lot of people. Do you, do you find which, which way do you, th- I maybe I know the answer to this question, but you don't know, but which way do you find like your fellow, uh, MMA guys, martial artists? I uh, feel like most martial artists, the most MMA guys that I'm around and jujitsu guys I'm around are more, uh, center or they're more rational thinking type people. They may not speak up about stuff, but yeah, anybody I feel like who routinely goes through adversity, I mm. think it doesn't bite into any of that shit. Hmm. Right. Mm, that's fascinating. When you're that's put into adversity on a daily basis, you, you accept a lot more things like you're you build resilience. That's what it is. Resilience. You're talking before right. about being, you know, getting people tougher to take things like resilience. Resilience isn't taught anymore, especially to boys and young men, because right. you know, they're, they're taught to be women. They're taught to <laughs> behave and do with their emotions like women. But I'm sorry, yeah. like. You, women do not have the levels of testosterone that men have. Like to me, positive masculinity is learning how to deal with testosterone. Interesting. Learning how to deal with it. Learning how to challenge. Cha- uh, how, how to it. challenge it. How to how to use it in a positive way. Because unbridled testosterone ends you up in prison. <laughs> right. It ends up you getting killing somebody or committing you know some doing some taking a risk that's way too large and, and getting killed or whatever. I think that's, right. that's, I think why you see, you know, 70% of the convicted rapists are, you know, boys who are raised by women and no male influence because they have testosterone that they don't know how to deal with. And it comes out in negative ways. Positive masculinity, how to effectively manage your testosterone. Yeah. That's an interesting way of putting it. You're, you're absolutely right because basically it's like... It, We've all, we learn, you know, I'm 6'4", 250. Mm-hmm. If this was in the old days, I would just go out and like bonk people <laughs> on the head and take what I wanted, yeah. women, things, land, whatever. And, and everything that we learned is like how to, how to like pull that, how to pull mm-hmm. that back in, but we can't well, eradicate it. I, I think you're looking at the past more rough than maybe it was, but cause I just <laughs> no, think, I'm, talking, I'm talking a long time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. hundred million years ago. But even then, like people still had to be social around each other so like right. I, even uh, even a million years ago when we're cavemen i think if you bonk somebody in the head there's a good chance that you'd have negative repercussions to come back from that <laughs> yeah, that's true you know that's true I, it's true so yeah. I, I like the fact that you uh you reached out to me a little bit talking about like want, wanting to engage some more yeah. and like produce some more man you've been really pushing out a ton of content uh, you, you're you're sort of up in in a common network uh, we, with some of the guys I run with mm-hmm. online. Yeah, I got and, to uh, meet uh, Goldman Unleashed. Did, did you York. really? Yeah. And Anthony Anthony Dream Johnson was it was there too. Just happened to be there. And oh, man. Uh, Goldman is a good. He was of mine. really he's a really cool guy. Really enjoyed his yeah. company. Yeah, yeah, he uh, is. He's, he's, he's going to make a West Coast trip. I think coming up. Hopefully, he he comes through. Yeah, he's a good dude. Uh, I've had him on the podcast also, and he uh, he and I have hung out a bunch of times. Uh, we met at the twenty one convention for the first time, and uh, since then we've just uh, we've stayed in touch and been really close. He's he's one of the true 
artists and true characters that mm-hmm. I've met and this whole yeah. experience who is exactly what he says he is yeah. online. Like I, 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 yeah, I got to hang out with him, watch him work, watch him do some camera pickup. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I Smart love the guy. fact that Twitter, Twitter can bring all these different worlds together. Mm-hmm. It's really amazing. And we can coalesce around ideas uh, and, and worldviews rather than just by happenstance or geography mm-hmm. or who happened to be in your dorm or live on your cul-de-sac or whatever, yeah. um, which is really one of the founding concepts of the liminal order, uh, my men's organization that's all about self-improvement and positive masculinity mm-hmm. and sort of understanding the world today and, and being equipped to handle uh, the future of these sort of online conflicts and the, and the, the culture conflicts that we have. Uh, is really that we were able to come together uh, under shared values and shared uh, worldview, even though we live all over the country, mm-hmm. come from different backgrounds, different religions, races, people from Europe and Australia and New Zealand and whatever. We've got uh, we've got over 100 members worldwide on three different continents now just after the first uh, six, six weeks or eight weeks or so. Nice. And uh, we're really uh, keeping to push it. And in fact, I have a question from one of the guys in Liminal Order. Uh, he, he wanted me to ask you, what had more impact on you, your first loss or your first win, and why? Hmm. Man, probably the first loss, I think, because it's uh, it thrusts you into reality. Because you have this ability to imagine yourself like indestructible or the best, and then to get your ass handed to you for the first time. Like... Uh, it opens your eyes up, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. yeah, definitely opens your eyes up. Well, my son was just uh, in the Little League World Series, and he uh, had a couple of crazy experiences. The first first time, first game, he hits a walk-off game-winning home run uh, to win the game and uh, goes completely viral on ESPN, gets a whole segment on SportsCenter, doing like, he's doing like a press junket at 12 years old. 12 years old. Uh, and then uh, in the next game, he pitches and he does he does really poorly, and uh, and I told him, look, man, there's only winning and learning, and uh, you know you you're gonna have to take away a learning lesson from this experience, and and in his case, it's still all about mindset and controlling your anxiety and and your stress mm-hmm. levels, um, but uh, you know if we can always look for the lesson in what we're doing, then we can always continue to fail upwards, Yep. Uh, which would be the title of a good book or death by ego. One of the two, hopefully we'll go with the first one for your, for your epitaph. Right. Um, and so, you know, this really, I, I think we've really covered a lot of ground, man, and we've gone through the whole journey and, and uh, I'm just really grateful that I had a chance to talk yeah, with man, you. Cool. Uh, you know, I, I fanboyed a little bit. I mean, I'm pretty psyched that I got to talk to John Fitch because, <laughs> you know, 15 years ago, man, I'm watching this. I'm paying for pay-per-views, and I'm watching, and I'm fucking rooting for you. And it was just, you know, we were from Indiana, man, Fort Wayne boys. Corn, corn fed, Allen corn County. Fed. Yep. <laughs> Three Rivers so, Festival. Uh, what's that? Three Rivers Festival. Three Rivers. Oh, my God. The Johnny Appleseed Festival, yep. dude. My God, I think about that sometimes with that like the little maze that they had with the straw. That was like highlight of my highlight of my childhood. Yeah, that's one of the best things about Indiana is the straw, the uh, straw mazes. The straw mazes, yeah. Popping up. Three River Festival, man. That place flooded every year too, if I remember. Um, All right, so John Fitch, where can we find you, buddy? Uh, At uh, website John Fitch 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 Smash. Uh, John Fitch dot net. It's also John Fitch or Fitch Smash dot com, but uh, John Fitch dot net. Uh, it's most of my stuff. Uh, official John Fitch on uh, YouTube, John Fitch Smash Instagram, John Fitch dot net spelled out on Twitter. And I'm all over the place. Failing Upward Dead by Ego is available on Amazon paperback and Kindle. Um, trying to uh, get some more content, some more stuff out there. I'm leaning towards you know like uh, masculinity type coach. Uh, post yeah. post fight career because I'm in the Bay Area, and uh, some of my friends, some of my girls that are from friends with, they talk to me about how these guys that they talk to, if guys that are around, need need to learn how to be men. <laughs> yeah, they're overly emotional and uh, moody, and they won't make eye contact, and they don't know how to plan dates, and there's just a lot of basic things that I think there's a lot of guys out here that could be, have use some help and get some help with. Yeah, and tell me the truth. The girls are like, oh, John, you should really teach these boys on how to be men. Isn't that right? Why can't they all just be more like you, John? <laughs> Something like that, I imagine. I mean, shit, I hear the same thing, and I'm not even famous. Um, so, 
Uh, that's a that's an interesting uh, career pivot. I mean, you can you coach now? Do you train guys? I mean, you're a black I have oh, uh, patreon.com backslash John Fitch. I have uh, technique <laughs> videos up there oh, awesome. that I do. I put up a weekly video for my five dollar contributors, and then uh, some of the other guys pay a dollar a month to support the blogs and the uh, and the live streams that I do on on YouTube. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got to I got to do a lot more work. I been so busy with uh, the move and I've got to start rescheduling some things and when you're training for fights it's hard to get anything done so I can imagine yeah, it's, yeah. well it's been awesome to talk to you I, I love the book uh, I'm a big fan of the Twitter feed I read uh, and watch a lot of the videos uh, I, I like the fact that we're walking sort of some of the same path um, gives me some hope for the future too mm-hmm. Um, thank you so much for, for joining me here. And I know that everybody's really going to enjoy this. Uh, John Fitch, everybody. Thank you very much, man. Let's do it again sometime. Thanks, man. It's good coming on.